Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the legendary and controversial Carl Crew. Everyone knows that he played Jeffrey Dahmer not too long after Jeffrey Dahmer was caught in The Secret Life, Jeffrey Dahmer, but he was also the star of the 1987 blood-curdling cult classic Blood Diner, directed by Jackie Kong, and he's the owner of the bar in Hollywood, California Institute of the Abnormal Arts, and it's going to be great to have him on the show today, talk about all those projects and what's new today. The world is getting crazier and weirder, but we will get through it, like we always do. We are strong. So yeah, here is my interview with Carl Crew. Hey, Carl. Oh yeah, I just missed your call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man. I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. This is a, a great. Scared. Yeah, this is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure, man. Yeah. So, going back in time, I was reading that uh, you come from a, a theater family. Um, you might say that. <laughs> um, all my family were performers. My mom was a concert pianist. Uh, my father was a cardiovascular surgeon, but they had a gospel quartet for 60 years. Um, my sister and brother were heavily involved in music. Um, my brother, as Grammy Award winning, wrote with Santana, Whitney Houston, all these people. Wow. Uh, but I chose a theater theatrical route, and uh, I remember going out as, it was like the Christian Partridge family, my, mom, my dad had a giant bus, you know, by motorhome, and I was on tour with the uh, Covenant Four, you know, and I was like, oh, I want to get in the show business, you know, yeah. so uh, actually I was in a theater troupe since I was like, different ones, actually two, since I was like 10, 11, until I was like 22. Wow. I grew up in theatrical, yeah. And then I started studying film and uh, wanting to get into film. My father used to sneak me out to movies, you know. Yeah. It'd be like a Wednesday night, you know, and my mom was like, you go get your coat. I'm like, ah! and I get my coat, and my mom's like, it's got to be a G. It's got to be a G, John, you know. Yeah. And like, you took me to Wither and all these R movies. It was really great. So. But he installed in me the love of film, you know. And, yeah. Uh, Whenever I would go anywhere, my head would be the camera, you know, moving, doing slow shots and all. It was crazy, but I uh, I started studying with uh, Michael Olton, mm -hmm. doing impressions of uh, classes and stuff. And who he was a there were uh, people that were in that class. We all moved to Hollywood at the same time. And, uh, yeah, started our road down there. Wow. Hey. Yeah, I grew up in the VHS era, so my dad and I, we would watch R-rated movies when my mom wasn't Ooh. home. <laughs> yeah. Just got to turn it off. Pause it. Yeah. yeah. I love the VHS, man. I, was, I, was, I bought a VHS, uh, a camera, a portable camera back when they were 2500 bucks. when I was like, uh, that's when I was uh, in the mortuary uh, business. Not yeah. for that reason, but making films on the side. But, uh, yeah, that was, like, crazy. It was affordable, too. You had a big pack, a giant camera. It was hilarious. But, yeah, yeah. I love VHF, man. You can do all kinds of editing and all this crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. Slowly, they have got it to the point where you cannot own films anymore. Yeah. That's what they're going you know, Then it went to the DVD, and then now it's all digital. You know, So they can snatch it away anytime they want to. I remember thousands of people had these huge collections of VHF, so... You can put on anything at any time you ever wanted and watch it 20 times. So, yeah, that's my, era, my era. Yeah, I still have a v VHS uh, player and I got a collection. Yeah, I love VHS. <laughs> so you you did a lot of traveling uh, growing up, um, doing the theater and stuff. I mean, was that was, that must have been an amazing experience? Well, I actually got to work with this guy named Lamar Fields. He was the director. I was in Genesis Players for the longest time. And uh, uh, this guy, he went on to direct these huge plays in London. He was brilliant. The best director I've ever worked with. Uh, back in that, that was like, you know, uh, not Hollywood at all. Mm -hmm. And he would take us out for whole weekends, our whole troupe, and rehearse. Weekends. I mean, and he taught me about so many different things, like uh, finding your light and uh, uh, projection, of course, and uh, 
but most importantly, to listen. You listen. You listen to how the other person says the line to you, so you can respond to how they said that, not just ba 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 ba. You know, right. that way you can build whole new vistas of stories and meanings to stuff. And that was really cool discovering that whole thing. You know, and we were, our whole troop was a bunch of hams anyway, so yeah. it was like uh, we just got to build all these different things just uh, based on listening to each other. So that was cool. Yeah. Did anybody in the uh, troupe uh, go on to become successful in acting? Um, well, I mean, everyone got a little piece of something, and uh, uh, no, any real, no, no real big stars, you know. Yeah. What was I your? Was. <laughs> Where was your favorite place to travel? Well, actually, we didn't travel too much, you know, in the theatrical troupe. We were just doing, we would perform for prisons and schools and churches and anything, you know, we'd just go oh. all over. <laughs> but it wasn't a, a national tours or anything like that, you know. Okay. It was extremely structured instruction. Uh, and uh, I'll always value that. I mean, uh, I don't like when going and doing a film and when there's no rehearsal, like, what are you doing? You know, like, I mean, I need rehearsal. I love the rehearsal. That's how you build camaraderie with your characters and, uh, uh, and that's just what I'm used to, so I love that. I've done a few films where they're okay, go, and I, I mean I can improvise, and that's fine. But there is a comfort you get from having rehearsed something and establishing a, a plateau to play on that's not there when you do improv. But it, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So, yeah. yeah. How about when you were when when you were studying acting later? Was there any classmates that went on to become successful? Uh, well, actually, uh, I just started working, you know, and I really, I mean, I didn't continue my studies as far as that. I did it by doing it. Uh, I, I was down in uh, Hollywood uh, uh, six months, and I got my first lead role in Blood Diner. And uh, actually, uh, I used to collect cars. You know, I, my first car I ever restored was a 49 Packard. <laughs> oh, gorgeous, you know. And it took like two years to get it painted and fixed and everything, and I was moving to Hollywood when it got fixed, so they came in and parked it in front of my house, or where I was staying, and uh, I was leaving that night, yeah. and I remember getting dark, and I go out, it's a beautiful Packard, and I get in it, I turn it on, and the black light dial comes on, I'm like, ah, you know, yeah. I'm from San Francisco, black light, you know, but so, and it drove like a beauty, you know, down the freeway, but I had two um, Cadillac limousines, 60 a 60 Cadillac limousine that was pink. Yeah. 61, uh, which was a champagne window. And uh, I, I just brought all these cars down here, and that's how I got on the moon set, because they rented the cars for me um, for a movie called Modern Girls. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You remember that movie? Oh, I've talked to a couple people from it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew Sherry Gillette became a friend of mine later. She was the mermaid in it. Anyway... So mm -hmm. I drove, this, I had a four, uh, what was this, 58 Pontiac Chieftain convertible. That's one they wanted also. So I drove that down to the set the first time going down there. And it was sunny. I'm going down the 405. It was a big warehouse. I get down there, my hair staying straight up because of the sun. I got a little sun tan. They go, hey, we'll, let's cast him as the doorman, you know. Yeah. And they put dude and everything. And you can't say anything. Of course I did. You know? but, uh, uh, but I learned very long ago about schmoozing. Mm -hmm. You know, you find out who people are, and you just stand in that area, and you just initiate a conversation. I remember when I was 16, I went to my first, uh, I went to the Led Zeppelin concert when I was 16. Nice. Yeah, nice. yeah. and I remember all our friends, we, were, we we went the first day, and we were standing, you know, we were across the whole stadium, it was like a Led Zeppelin echo. Yeah. But we had to, to, you know, investigate, and we stood by the backstage met these people we were backstage the second day literally on bleachers behind Led Zeppelin nice yeah, from, and I remember you know, like six months ago I was looking online on a big TV of, of footage of that concert and I found myself a, a shot of myself sitting on the bleacher it was hilarious I, I thought it was a dream you know yeah but uh, anyway uh, but smoothing is very important or just understanding who does what so uh, on that set, I started schmoozing with the director and with the casting director, who was kind of uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I got a call two weeks later. Oh, uh, they can't cast this role because uh, everyone, they hate everyone. You know, what do you want to come read for us? I said, sure. So uh, 
I uh, I drove up to this house in the Hollywood Hills on, and it was Jimmy Maslin's house. In it. And I walk in, and they said, "Oh well, this character is retarded, and everyone who's <laughs> done it done it like retarded." Yeah. And that's why. And I go, okay, well, I'm just going to play it slow and very animated. And whatever, you know. So I did it. And uh, they said, okay, fine. But thank you, you know. And, and we'll when send you to New York for to get to see what they think. So two, two days later, I'm, I'm uh, at my house and uh, I got a call. And I was like, you got, and I missed the call. Mm-hmm. And I get the recording. It was back when they had recording things on. Yeah. You got the pot, you know. I'm like, ah! I always go ten times around the moon, you know, in the old days. Yeah. And um, little did I know I was getting a lead role for two hundred fifty bucks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we were we were ninety percent through filming, and I was doing my wrestling scene, and mm-hmm. uh, my co my co lead uh, Rick Birch, brilliant guy. Yeah. He was on set. He was getting he did getting pissed. You know, it's like. And he said, let's just stop. Let's just say we're not going to finish the film unless they give us more money. So we did. We got a little more money, but it was nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, it was a crazy experience. And, uh, I mean, I'll never forget it. You know, it was yeah. really, really amazing. It was amazing. But that's how I smoothed my way. Oh, anyway, so uh, that's how I smoothed my way into that in that role. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then it just kind of went on from there. Actually, I've had five agents, and they've really never done anything for me. Yeah. Everything I've gotten, I've got on my own. That's you know, good. Up to, uh, the Dahmer film, I was, I what, what happened was, I started making movies with uh, Bill Osco, yeah. who was the executive producer, one of the producers on Blood Diner. Right. And we 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 did another movie with uh, them uh, called The Underachievers. Yeah. And it had in it Vic Tabak, Barbara Carrera, Derek Morris, Jules uh, Shepard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, and uh, uh, who else? Uh, uh, just all kind of Eddie Albert Jr. Uh, oh yeah. And anyway, so uh, we just had a little two roles. We played the little gangsters, whatever. But uh, then we then Bill and I started making movies, and um, we did it for about ten years. Mm-hmm. And of course, he got divorced from Jackie, and they had a horrible hating of each other. And then I was ousted by Jackie. You know, like uh, I remember one time I came on the set, the, the lady told me, "You have a week vacation." And I and I called the next day to make sure, and I had missed a night because of what the lady told me. And I came to set you, to the speaker, Carl Crew, you were show up last night. What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, and I went right to Bill and I said, dude, you know, this lady told me I had my day off. You just relax, you know. Yeah. So I mean, there's this weird thing which I can call her. I've never said a bad word about her, but uh, when they just released Blood Diner on Blu-ray. Yeah. They had these screenings uh, or, or signings, you know. I got called by one of the uh, stores that were doing the signing because I know them. They go, oh, you got to come down and sign the Blu-ray. She's Jack Kong going to be there, blah, blah, blah. I go, I'm oh, fine. So I got there, and I walk in, and she wasn't there yet. Mm-hmm. And the lady goes, oh, well, uh, uh, no, 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 it was somebody from Lionsgate. Because Lionsgate did a brilliant job of re-releasing it, remastering it. They interviewed us, and... Uh, but they did brim. I was very happy with what they did. But yeah. the guy goes, yeah, uh, Jackie Kong just said she doesn't want anyone here, so um, maybe she'd just go. And I'm like, whatever, I don't care. And the lady who owns the place goes, no, stay. There's going to be plenty of people who want to sign you to sign this. I go, I'll just go get a, a drink at Porto's and come back. You know, you gotta, <laughs> I came back, and there she was. I walked up to Jackie Kong, and, and the, you're at the uh, DP who's sitting right next to her. Hi, Jackie. And she goes, and you are? <laughs> I think the star of the movie, uh, one of the stars, and she goes, "Oh!" And she had just taken a picture with the with the with the uh, the uh, janitor. Yeah. Okay. I go, "Oh, can, you know, for old sake, can we just tell get a picture?" Here? Oh no, I don't do pictures. I'm like, "Really? We're in the seventh grade? Come on!" <laughs> and I go, "Europe, come on, let's go." No, I can't do it because she won't. So I said, fine. And I went over to my little table and I took all their people and I signed all their stuff. So whatever, you know, I have nothing against her, but she's got this weird thing. They were going to have, yeah. a, they had a big screening at the uh, China, Chinese Man Theater. And I was going to come down. I just saw her online. I, I said, uh, going. And she contacted me, don't you dare show up. She contacted me through Facebook. I go, what are you talking about? It's a public place. If you come back, I'm going to call the police. I go, I will bring an officer with me if I want to come. 
but I'm not going to come because I don't care. You know, so have a nice time. Yeah. So, any blah, 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 whatever. You know, she's never done another film since then. So, you know, and I, I whatever. I mean, Bill just passed two years ago. Yeah. That was really hard. He came out for an interview uh, for the Blu-ray. And uh, we were we were working together for about a year after that, just developing stuff. And, and he passed, man. He got, uh, yeah, it was really awful. Yeah, I, I, I talked. So, uh, yeah, that was not cool. But uh, anyway. Yeah, I talked to Howard Zime, and um, you know, him, him and Bill, you know, were were not on good terms, you know, up until his death. But uh, he owes his whole oh. career. Bill uh, Howard Zime, who did Fle- uh, Flesh Gordon. Oh, by the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I, ripped, uh, I don't know anything about it, but. Yeah, he owes his whole career to him, you know. But um, when you got the script for Blood Diner, I mean, what did you think of it? I was like, "Wee, get a lead role, I didn't care. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, uh, cool. I, and there was actually rehearsal, it was great. I was very happy. Um, and it seemed to go really well, though it was very chaotic. And, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it was just fun. It was like full on. And uh, uh, it was cool. I mean, I, I was thrilled. Do you have a favorite kill in the movie? All of them. No, I like when they chop the chip in half, you know, whatever, with one slice. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, it's to me, a horror comedy is, but I grew up on Romero. Uh, I grew up on all the horror movies. You same know, here. And, uh, but I like to laugh. I like to be scared and laughing at the same time. That's the magic. That's the elixir. Oh, so yeah. I love horror comedy. I think that's just—I just love that. And if you watch anything enough time, it becomes a horror, a comedy. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> even the Dahmer movie becomes a comedy if you watch it enough. And Lord knows we saw it enough in the uh, post-production. But dark, macabre, yeah. Yeah, I like my corner of the macabre. Yeah. So what what made you uh, want to play uh, Jeffrey Dahmer? Well, the funny thing is, I was on the phone with Bill, and uh, <laughs> we were talking, and he was on the TV news. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer. He goes, you know, you look a little like Jeffrey Dahmer. I just went, ding! And immediately that night, I got online, got the police report, and started writing the script. You know, and, uh, yeah, and then it went on from there. We got an investor, and we started shooting. The best, the thing I learned, actually, from meeting all these, like, uh, people involved in exploitational directors, you know, like Michaels and all these other people, uh, was... Certain things like, you know, when you make an announcement, you announce it, oh, we're shooting this in secret. So we announced on the yeah. trades, when we went into casting, we're shooting this Dahmer movie in secret. My my fax machine, if, if anyone knows what that is anymore, mm-hmm. exploded in a month. <laughs> Literally, curls of steam were coming out to get a new one. It was like 50,000 faxes that came through. You know, because everyone heard secret. Oh, so everyone wanted to get involved. It's hilarious, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's just a little uh, nugget, you know, to use in the future. But uh, it only works once. But it was cool, and uh, yeah, it just developed there. It was a that was a roller coaster. Did, did you hear from the Dauber family about it? Actually, I I had a chance to meet Jeffrey, and I didn't want it. Uh, but I did talk to his uh, I talked to his uh, stepmother on the phone. Mm-hmm. We we went back to we did Milwaukee's talking. The show mm-hmm. Milwaukee's talking. They flew us back there for that, and I was literally interviewed at Jeffrey Dahmer's door. I stood outside his door, and they interviewed me inside his door. And I remember during the interview, I reached out and touched the door. Mm-hmm. I definitely felt something was still there. A, a very, very dark, a dark presence was definitely still there. Wow. Uh, you know, they make of that whatever you like, but I have sensitivity to stuff like that. I was like, mm. Anyway, uh, the next day, the, the paper uh, said... Carl Cruz star Jeffrey Dahmer makes love to Jeffrey Dahmer's door. You know, like, <laughs> out. You know, he's like, oh. I go, dude, you cannot buy publicity like that. Come on, you know. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> then we went did the Maury Povich show for like a month later, and when it was in New York, a whole hour, and uh, you know they whipped the film. When we did Milwaukee's Talking, I mean, of course, this is the most necessary, you know, notorious serial killer. Of course, there's been a movie about it, you know, of course. Yeah. And they were like, hey, you know, the families and everything. But by the time we made it to Maury Povich, oh, they whipped him up into a frenzy, man. It was like the barbecue Carl Cruz show, you know. <laughs> and actually, I archived it. So it's on my Facebook page, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, The Secret Life. And I car, you can see it. And uh, I had hesitation about sh- doing that because 
I might have really, really been attacked. I got slapped, you know, uh, mm-hmm. by Janetta. She was a representation of the family. And she slapped me. And she'd say, you Jeffrey Dahmer number two. And I'm like, really? You know, uh, I, mean, I, was, I love debate. So I was like engaged, you know, um, yeah. and I, and looking back at it now, I'm very sensitive to, uh, uh, they're losing their family members, you know, I'm not as sensitive to that at all. I, I, and I feel sorry for all these people. I pray that they, they've got some kind of, you know, uh, restoration from that. God, I don't see how you ever can, but, but, uh, you know, uh, but I post it anyway. So it's, uh, it's interesting, uh, barbecue Carl for show. Yeah. yeah. But that was a whole weird deal. I'd actually... The weird thing that came out of that was I made friends with one of the family members mm-hmm. um, whose family was, and not Jeffrey's, uh, this was the victim's family member. Oh, yeah. And her brother was killed and eaten by Jeffrey, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I made friends with her, and I started talking to her for two years on the phone because I could make her laugh, and we had a great time. And she was the one that told me that she was the only victim's family member to go and visit Jeffrey in prison. And she said, he saw my film. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow. I said, well, what was his reaction? And she said, well, the guards made sure he saw it. And she said that he scooted his seat really close to the TV. Mm -hmm. And he turned around and said, is that the guy that played me? And they go, yeah. and that's all I know. <laughs> but I'm the only one who can say Jeffrey saw my film before he was murdered. Yeah. Oh. I mean, that's something. I got I got really good reviews from, uh, uh, better reviews than the Jeremy Renner film. Yeah. Uh, 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 Kevin Thomas from the LA Times. You know, so, yeah, we were really low budget, you know. Yeah. I mean, that was not a huge budget for them, but for us. But we just wanted to make it really, uh, I mean, all the dialogue was out of Jeffrey's own mouth. I mean, I, I used all his stuff from his police interview, so it's kind of authentic in that way. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of things, like I never wore glasses, and, uh, yeah. you know, there were a couple of weird influences that came in with the casting, or I didn't like most of some of the casting, although I was very you know, participating in finding people. Uh, we used a few uh, you know, people got in that I didn't like, but whatever. And, you know, they gave me, they had they talked to the director and giving me a bunch of extra hair in the back. I'm like, what? Like, what are you doing, you know? And I, but I was so intensely playing it, I, I didn't, I should have, you know, looked a little more at the details. But but it's gotten some great reviews, whatever. You know, I'm actually writing for two right now. Nice. Yeah. And it's about his prison years. And, uh, and Jeffrey Dahmer gets saved, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna yeah. rewrite history. <laughs> what? You're gonna rewrite history. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show what actually happened. Oh, because okay. he got saved. He he did a Bible course, and he decided he wanted to become a Christian. And mm. he was having these horrible things, like how could I ever do that? How could I ever become a Christian? And oh yeah. That uh, uh, came into him and led him to the Lord. You know, we talked to him a long time. And, and he was talking about the grace of Jesus has covers everything. So, you know, if, and it's really this going to mess with people's minds because, like, oh, well, I've done too many things to go to heaven. You know, child, if Jeffrey Dahmer's in heaven, <laughs> it's gonna, wow. And really, what happened was he became a Christian, and then he brought put. He knew he was going to be murdered. Mm-hmm. I mean, serial killers like him are always murdered in prison, right. pretty much. It's a sign of a, a, you know, it gives you points, you know, to murder a serial killer. Uh, but anyway, he had that premonition. So he wanted to be baptized, and they wouldn't let him. And he was talking to this other guy who arranged it in a certain way where he kind of snuck in and baptized him in prison. And after he was baptized, he was murdered two weeks later. So it's an intense, it's intense, man. I, I, been, I actually have the whole script structured out. I'm about a third of the way through right now, but it's going to mess with people. I actually just got done two and a half years writing my great uncle's history nice. which is bigfoot wow my great uncle jerry crew was the first person to take a plaster cast of bigfoot in 1958 on mount shasta if you google jerry crew bigfoot there he is holding the cast and went worldwide in 1958 <laughs> I, I live right here in reading too <laughs> oh very cool yeah he's very familiar 
And yeah. like, uh, he, it's Willow Creek. Come on, Love Creek. Yeah. And Mount Shasta. And Humboldt Times, you know, that's when he first took his plaster cast to the Humboldt Times and they took pictures and that's the picture that first started everything. Uh, he, but my father and my other uncle were worked with him on the trails, mm-hmm. clearing, you know, brush and cutting down trees. And uh, so I went through like, 50 years of yellow newspaper articles from my uncle Jim, you know, and all the magazines it was ever in. And, uh, uh, and then I interviewed people like incredible characters in this. Oh my goodness. Like Peter Burns, he's 94, I think. Yeah. And he was Indiana Jones, Don Quixote character that hunted uh, Yeti in the Himalayas. And he hunted elephant and he grew up in the tea fields of Ceylon. I mean, this guy, I was so honored to interview this guy like three or four times, and uh, um, he was hired by. There's so many characters. Um, Tom Slick, he was an eccentric millionaire who hung out with Howard Hughes and all the Hollywood set. He was from Texas, and he hired these people to hunt Bigfoot, and he brought Peter Burns in to shake down these people who was paying to hunt Bigfoot, and they weren't getting any results. And he went into this town and fired most of them because there were two of them that were in jail two of you know it's like yeah. crazy. you're just making that money you know anyway so i got to dig through this family history uh uh and it was just amazing it was a journey and i just finished it like a month ago that's cool so, yeah so i get some meetings about that coming up but i'm excited about that because i've heard stories all my life about that yeah so, did you ever get a chance to see the uh uh shea st john stuff shea st john no Tr- Shea St. John. Well, if you go on Google and type in Shea, S-H-A-Y-E, Saint, S-A-I-M-T, J-O-H-N, Trigger Happy. Trigger it's happy. a doc I did about working with the most handicapped performance artist in the world. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I worked with her for 10 years. I never saw her face. <laughs> no one did. Yeah. She wore a big mask over her face. She had been in a, a train accident. It's a big, long story, and we explain what really happened. She literally is in a witness protection program right now. Wow. Yeah. It's a big, it's the weirdest thing I've ever had. My friend Eric was a brilliant photographer, incredible editor, uh, and absolutely, he was, best, he was one of my best friends. And he met her in an art colony, and he brought her in uh, to the club I was running. And we started shooting Shea St. John. And we did it for about 10 years, uh, off and on. And, uh, and now it's she, it's worldwide. I mean, there's nightclubs all over the world. I mean, uh, uh, fan clubs all over the world. And she got, like, reviews from Bizarre Magazine. The paraplegic Phyllis Diller. I mean, she talked <laughs> again, again. And she collected bird dolls. I mean, you have no idea. Yeah. It was the worst thing I've ever had to deal with. And I, I'm so, I grieve every time I think, you know, if Eric had lived, uh, he would have experienced this whole new wave of technology would have blown people's minds with his talents. So, yeah, that's a whole, you'll laugh really hard when you see that. You'll be a little scared, but you'll laugh. Though. Okay, I'll check it out. Cool. Um, so what made you want to open a bar? Um, I didn't want to ever open a bar. Um, I wanted to open a performance art museum. Mm-hmm. And it tri- we just started wine and beer. We're not a bar. Um, it always was about a performance art. Uh, when we first opened, uh, and you know, in the 90s, you know, it was all like Dead Dolls and CIA, you know, you know, good, you know yeah. kids stuff and everything. So uh, I actually took over this building for uh, to make a video distribution company for some of the films I had done because I was sick of getting ripped off. So we set up Millennium Video, and that went down to, like in about nine months with UPS and the phone charges. Back when Ma Bell was like bloodthirsty nightmare. I mean, literally, it was crazy. It just sucked money out of me. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm in this building and, I, and the business is not going. And my friend comes in, he's producer, he goes, I want to have an Academy Award party here. I said, cool. So I, I made some calls and I suddenly I came into all these movie sets from Gary Collins' t- uh, Today Show. Yeah. But I had to take a. So we had four 40 foot trucks coming down Lancashire and we got to just plop them all in the building and just arrange them all and it was like a wonderland it was a trip and, uh, and then we uh, then we had the party and it was so successful uh, 
it was so successful. We were just like, duh, what do we got to do this? You know, and uh, we didn't have dime one. And so we just opened underground as the CIA, California Institute of Abnormal Arts. And what we would do, we would, we'd put on regular bands, but between the bands, we'd put on the weirdest performance art we could ever find. So people would walk out like, what did I just see? I didn't even know. They would walk out just shocked and laughing, you know, and uh, uh, it, it was fun, you know, it was uh, very avant-garde, very uh, edgy stuff, I mean, fringe of the yin-yang, and uh, uh, yeah, so it was an interesting mix, and uh, actually I started to meet a lot of the entertainment people, we did a lot of screenings, and uh, a lot of directors and actors came down, it was just, you know, um, for years I just wanted to live on the outside of Hollywood, you know, just be, you know, as far from it as possible, not the business, but just you know, the mess. And uh, I used to drive down the street and go, man, I would never live on this street. Yeah. God was like, <laughs> yeah, and then 20 years later, oh, again. So, um, yeah, it's been a, it was a very good for me because it, it put me around people so much that I could talk to anybody. I don't care who it is. You know, I don't care. I can talk to anybody. I mean, I can I just find something we can talk about. And it forces me to do that even though I'm an extrovert anyway, but it, it kind of refined it a little bit. So, yeah, it came in handy. Yeah, I, t I take I'm it... I'm tired of it. Yeah. I, want, I want to focus back on filmmaking now. Yeah. I, I take it uh, because you guys just serve beer and wine, you don't get, you don't get any fights there. <laughs> oh, no, we've got everything there. I mean, people used to sneak it in. Really? Uh, no idea what I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> My eyes are still burning from what I've seen, yeah. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not the sloppy tequila nightmare uh, that other places are, but, uh, uh, you know, I see some crazy stuff, man. Uh, Me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard about it. It's 500 pages, and it's only for the f first 15 years. Yeah. Um, it was self-published, and I got, like, a thousand copies, and it all sold out. So it cost, like, $39 for, to print each book because it was full-color, 500 pages, textbook size. So it cost a fortune to print, and I couldn't make any money on it. But I'd probably get them printed them up again. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but what an invaluable experience uh, in a way. But child, mm -hmm. try to run a club in Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so aside from those projects that um, you already mentioned, uh, is there anything else you're working on? Um, well, there's plenty of stuff. I mean, I wrote a, I wrote a. Uh, I have about 10 scripts that I've written and we're waiting to see what happens. Uh, uh, I wrote a script called The Fall of the Knights Templar, which was about uh, set in the 14th century. Um, and that was bought from where I finished it. They used to come over and 